There we are. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Southport Whiskey Club. And tonight we are drumming with Hugh from James Eady. We're going to go through six drums of rather tasty looking whiskey. So, Hugh, please take it away. Ah, thank you very much, Peter. And thank you, everyone, for joining me on this lovely Thursday. Um, it's great to be back at Southport. I think it was this time last year I did my first Zoom tasting with you guys for Garson's birthday. So, it's always nice to be invited back and, and to thank you for your support. Um, and I'm really looking forward to August. And that comes around because we'll be up there uh, then. Uh, but tonight we'll be looking at our new spring release uh, alongside uh, Trademark X. Um, so as Peter said, we have six whiskies uh, tonight, uh, starting with the Trademark X. Then we're going to try our two new small batches, the Blair Athel and Craig Gullicky. And then finishing on our three uh, cast straight one, uh, Glen Dullin single cask, an inch gallon finished in refill Doloroso sherry butt, and finishing with a nice uh, single cask Colila. So uh, a good lineup and sort of showcasing uh, our release that came out in April. So uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And if you have any questions throughout, I can talk for far too long. So any questions, even just type it in the chat or I think there's an, an emoji where you can put your hand up and, and, and do far away. Um, nothing's off the limits. We're an independent bottler, uh, if you haven't heard of James E.D. Uh, before. So that means we don't own a distillery. So I won't be drawing on about our distillery character and, and how our stills work. We're talking about whiskey in general which is always fantastic. And, and as with that lineup, you'll be trying uh, sort of different flavours. So hopefully there is one that suits you. And I always say, because we do two releases a year, uh, one in spring and one in autumn. If you don't like this release, then do try our next release uh, in, in autumn and hopefully you'll find something there for you. Um, without further ado, do, do start sipping away. As I said, I, I could keep talking. So do start sipping at Trendmark X. And I'll talk you through our history, um, who James E.D. was, um, and then it's wonderful revival story uh, by my boss Rupert uh, and our master blender Norman. Um, so trademark X uh, or James Eady, we should start with. Um, James Eady was actually a, a brewer, uh, born in in Blackford up in Scotland, um, but moved down to Staffordshire at the age of fourteen to work for uh, his uncle, who used to blend and sell tea, and eventually start uh, started selling malt to all the breweries in Burton which Burton being well famous for its, its beer and personalization. Uh, so at the age of 24, after James selling all the small to these uh, breweries, uh, decided to build his own on Cross Street. So Trademark X, being the marketing genius it is, uh, is because of the cross uh, on Cross Street. So yeah, just at the mere age of 24, uh, him and his business partner built uh, the brewery. Uh, and then it was basically operational from 1854. Uh, so from 1854, he started making his beer and started buying pubs. So he starts buying pubs as well. Uh, so he was a publican. Uh, and sadly, his business um, partner uh, died back in the 1850s. I don't think the life expectancy was too long. Uh, so he carried it on. So obviously through uh, adversity, he sort of stuck at it. And by the time of his death, which was in the early 1900s, he had 200 pubs, or 250 pubs uh, to his name. And every single one of those pubs was his trademark X, his James E.D.'s trademark X. Now, not only did he make beer, but he did sell wine and lots of sherry, uh, but most importantly for us uh, was his family recipe. So um, we, we have a record from Alfred Barnard, who's a very famous whiskey writer. Uh, he went around all the distilleries and you know some of his, um, his sort of takings and his recordings have inspired Lagavulin Nape for instance. But after he did that, he decided to go around all the breweries of the United Kingdom. So in his brewing book, he meets James. And in uh, in his sort of segment on James, he says that um, James and him basically in, in short terms had a bit of a knees up. And James showed him his family whiskey that was handed down from his father. So we believe that James's father, who was also a brewer from, from Blackford, um, actually had the recipe and so for when James set up his own uh, brewery he asked his dad for the family recipe um, now they were very successful as I said they had 250 pubs uh, and trademark X was in every single one of them uh, and sadly uh, in 1933 Bass who, um, who were the big brewers of the time bought uh, James E.D.'s uh, company uh, of his son uh, and by 1946 because they were a brewery they stopped with his whiskey and concentrate on his beer. So people still remember his beer up in Burton, um, but the whiskey stopped being produced around about 1946. Um, so it fell silent uh, until Rupert, as I mentioned, my boss, revived it back in 2017. So 71 years uh, dormant, 
he got his hands on the ledgers and from there he has recreated his family recipe. Now I'm sure you've already nosed it and tasted it um, and you can see there's an array of flavours in there uh, and the most important part for us and what we do uh, at James E.D. is A, basically sticking to James E.D.'s um, sort of mantras that he, he, he created. And he was very successful, so we joke that we haven't created a new company, we're just copying what he did. And the way we're able to copy him is because of his ledgers. So when Rupert got sent uh, up on his sort of odyssey uh, for the family uh, bl uh, blend, uh, it was from his uncle who phoned him up and said, Rupert, how are you? I hear you know you now left Diageo. Rupert used to work at Diageo, and you, you're sort of looking to do your own thing. Did you know that there used to be a family whiskey? He goes, well, I, I've heard about it, but I thought we were more brewers. Uh, so he said, why don't you go up to Burton on Trent and go to the brewing archives and see what you can find there? So Rupert sort of this is back in oh, this must be about 2014, 15. Uh, Rupert drives up to Burton and gets greeted by this lovely lady who still looks after the archives there, uh, and she sort of smiling be like oh you know your relative james Ely is absolutely brilliant come on in and in if you're ever up in Burton, if you're passing through do go and see the brewing archives because it's rich with history or, or sort of the history of brewing uh but for us james was a very generous man and he gave a lot back to burton so there's big art artifacts of of his old brewery basically there's old um the old thing that he used to deliver his beer on the cart that he used to deliver his beer on loads of glass bottles and most importantly for us were his ledgers. So in his ledgers, which is basically modern day Excel spreadsheets, is the recipe for beer, which we don't obviously need to use, but it was also the 16 whiskies that he used to make his Trainwork X. And also uh, the cast that he used to mature his, whis uh, his whiskies in, which comes in very important into our cast finish program that we'll talk on later. Um, so from there, Rupert was looking at these 16 whiskies. He realised that two of those have actually closed at the turn of, 19, uh, of the 20th century. So he can't get his hands on those. But he's determined to stick to the sort of the history. He's determined to sort of track down the other 14 uh, uh, whiskies. So two of them uh, were closed in 1993 and I think 1992. So Little and Canvas. So he went around the industry and, and sort of told the story of, of this wonderful family blend. Uh, and... Everyone, because the whiskey industry is so generous, everyone sort of got behind him and sold him some casks. So he had that. Um, and then so from there, so he's got the, the recipe, so to speak, and he's got the ingredients, but he needs, you know, the artist and, 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 and the master blender. Uh, so he asked his great friend, Norman Matheson, who's been in the industry for about 60, since he was 17, and he's now about 72. So he's had it for a few years of blending. He used to work for White and Mackay, so... Um, we were in the in the whiskey rooms up in Edinburgh and he was looking around and he was like, oh, I made most of these blends. And you're talking about like 1970s black and white and all these amazing old blends. Uh, so an uh, array of uh, experience and because of the wonderful story or the revival of the family um, blend, he was, he was straight in and he was more than happy to go. And he was intrigued because this is a blend from the golden age of Scotch around about the 1860s. Um, so he wants to go and, and revive it now. So we've got the, the ingredients, we've got the recipe and we've got the blender. But the most important thing for Rupert is replicating his family's whiskey. So uh, he needs to get an old bottle. So he phones up all the collectors and he looks on all the secretary markets and, and all that, but he can't find any of James E.D.'s trademark acts. When his uncle, who sent him on the quest, phones him up about six months later, uh, and he goes, how's it all going? And he goes, it's all great, but I just can't find a bottle and it's really infuriating. So I don't really want to go into this without knowing what it used to taste like. Otherwise, you know, did it have loads of, was it really smoky or was it sort of quite sweet? Um, so he was sort of pulling his hair out of that when his uncle turned to him and said, ah, oh, I've got a case of it in my cellar. <laughs> after sort of all, all that hunting down, uh, eventually the man who sent him on, on his way actually had a whole case of it. So he sends up the case to Rupert. And if you go on our website, you'll see that he uncorks this bottle here, which I have here. Uh, sadly empty. Rupert's got the other bottles hidden away, so we can't all try it. Uh, but if you do go on our website, because there is a whole sort of story of how Rupert uh, revived it, and you'll, you'll, you'll see Norman, Norman's in the video as well. Uh, but when this gets uncorked, you'll see that Rupert's face is completely pitch white. Like there's no colour in it. And he's, he's usually a very talkative man, but he's, he's very quiet as Norman puts the corkscrew in. So it's not like this one today where you've got the, 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 the old uh, 
stopper. Uh, it's like a wine bottle. So hopefully his his uncle was in wine, so hopefully he knew how to store it. But instead of in wine, you store it sideways because you want the sort of cork to let the oxygen in. Whilst whiskey's got to be uh, stored upright. So luckily his uncle had stored it properly. And you see when Norman pops a cork and he smells it, he goes, "Oh, it smells delicious!" And then the colour just rushes back to Rupert's face. Like he's sort of over the moon that all his sort of toils all come to this moment. And uh, when Norman pours it out, you see that it's a very sherried whiskey. It's, it's quite a dark whiskey. But from that, when Norman tries it, you get what you get in your glass today is sort of that sweetness and it ends with that bit of smoke. It's not overpowering on, on the smoke. Um, so you get all those sort of different flavours. Now, sadly, you, I don't think you got your uh, pamphlets. I didn't send up any pamphlets, but uh, next time we see you in August, I'll bring them with you. Um, but we didn't realise until we put them on the map, if everyone could see the map there. You probably can't see the distilleries. But it wasn't until we put it on the map that we realised that James was using whiskies from all different types of region, uh, Scottish uh, producing regions. So Camdown, uh, Isla, Highland, Speyside and Lowland. Now, today, people can argue that that's not particularly important because of technology and the development of, of technology uh, and, and making whisky. But when James was blending, it was hugely important. The sort of terroir was, was very influential. So you can see even James back in the, the, the 1800s was concentrated on quality and bringing those best distilleries. Now, the only reason only sort of four distilleries are closed is because the other 12 are obviously fantastic distilleries. And you've got the likes of like Abelawa, Lagavu and Coley, La Talisca, uh, Campbelltown, which I can't tell you what it is, but it's not Springbank or... Uh, <laughs> um, and... And then Cameron Brew is at the other grain. So the two grains are Canvas and Cameron Brew. And then you have 12 malts. So from Norman Pallinton it and, and nosing it, um, he went about making the sort of modern version. So in 2017, uh, James Lee's Train Marquette, which is this bottle here, uh, was revived. And we're now on to our fourth batch. So it is, it is now on the Solera batting, but it's our fourth batch. Um, the fourth batch is all natural colour. This has a bit of caramel uh, in it just to make sure it's consistent across. Uh, but now we've moved to natural colour because the whiskers are slightly older. Uh, and it's just, it's been amazing. Uh, so I got my job in 2018 and I was a single malt snob on a misser. I used to work in a whisky shop and I wouldn't sell anyone blends. Um, and so on my job interview, when, when Rupert told, asked me if I wanted to try this blend, I just said, just say yes. Just drink it. Hopefully he gives you a job and then we'll, we'll find out. Well, we'll find a way to sell it um, if you don't like it. Um, and at the time, I'd just left uni, so I was living at home. And my parents wanted to be out of the house. I wanted to go out of the house, so it was very important that I said yes. And actually, when I tried it, because I've only drunk those single malts, so Lagavulin like 16 is what my dad used to drink, so that's what I used to steal when I was a teenager. Um, and then the Glenfiddich and the Glenfiddich 12 and all, all the ones that you see, you know, the big brands. I never had experienced that array of flavours all in, in one taste. And I, I just thought when I got that, when I got the sweetness at the start and a bit of spice and then the smoke coming through, I was like, I've never really experienced that. I've only really had smoky or I've had spicy or I've had sweet. Uh, and it just opened my eyes up to sort of this art of blending. So throughout the rest of the tasting, whilst we look at the single warm elements, um, I'll keep reverting back to, to blending because fundamentally, obviously nowadays you have new distilleries, but fundamentally every distillery built was an ingredient for a blend. And talking to Norman, and, and the way he sort of processes the blends and the flavours, it's absolutely fascinating. So I think with the modern age, people are overlooking blends, thinking, you know, it's not the skillful part of the industry. Was actually the whole skill is the master blender finding these flavours and, and pairing them together. So I think Trademark X is a wonderful um, example of that. It's very easy drinking, uh, but it's also that it's got that complexity to it, so it's, it's not boring. Um, and so finally, to sort of sum up, as, as I said, Norman sort of got on board because he wanted to make an old, old the golden era of, of blend. So it split 6% grain, 40% malt. Uh, our grain, our canvas is obviously around about 26 years old. So it's got old grain, which what used to be in those sort of blends. Um, and then the malts range from about six years old to sort of 12 to 15. So that's why it's a non-age statement, because legally you can't, you, you have to put the youngest uh, whiskey on there. Um, but it's just reviving this wonderful sort of, nugget from the, from the past. Um, and to put it into context as well, you see there's three dates on our label. Uh, 1854, which is when James 
um, made, uh, built his brewery. Uh, 1877 is when he trademarked Trademark Act. So being in 1875, they passed the trademark law. And so two years after that, he trademarked, actually trademarked Cross Street. Uh, and to put that into context, I think that's 15 years before Shiraz Brothers did it. So we talk now, you know, you've got Johnny Walker and you've got Bells and you've got Shivers Brothers. These were all, they were all around at the same time. Now, jo James Ely got bought out by a brewer. So they stopped producing his whiskey, but if he got bought out by one of these distillers, then it could have been a different story. You never know, we could have had a, a massive shop on Princess Street in Edinburgh, but it just got tailed off in history. So reviving this um, family, uh, owned brand. It's a back in the family. Rupert owns all of it. Um, it's just been a wonderful ride and just sticking, sticking to James's values that you can see throughout the ledgers and in all our archives and, and just working everything back to what James is doing. It's just been fantastic. So hopefully um, you enjoy the whiskies. Um, we want to make drinkable whiskies that are affordable uh, and enjoyable, most importantly. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoy the Trademark X. As I said, it's it's something that changed my mind on, on blends and the history of blending. But um, I always get asked, what's your, if you had one more whiskey, if you have one whiskey for the rest of life, what would you have? I would say Trademark X because of the, the diversity in, um, and it, of those flavours. So actually, if you put ice in it, we cool it down and get smokier. And if you warm it up, it gets sweeter. Uh, <laughs> but if I was on death row, it would always be a Kohlila. If I had to have, go out with one dram, it would be a Kohlila. And I particularly like... Um, our powder cortado finishes that we did. So hopefully there'll be another one out in September. Was that the one that everyone came back to uh, in the summer festival you poured for everyone? Yeah, yeah we poured the after car it. sample. Everyone was under the absolutely crazy for that. Um, and they came back. We, we do one a year of those. So um, we'll move on to the independent bottling uh, side of things. But um, and it's also very important to, to say that when Norman... Um, join join the team he every, he's just whiskey guru and he said to rupert um you can't rush whiskey so if you're if you're gonna set up your own company just never rush whiskey when it's ready it's ready so if you just look after your whiskey and you bottle it when it's ready then you won't have a problem uh so that's everything that we do so we sample all our whiskeys we make sure it's all all ready to go and obviously there's only three of us as rupert leon and myself um so there's a bit of arguments because everyone's got their own own palettes but um it's just looking after the whiskey and then put it in the bottle you can't rush it so uh hopefully you can taste that uh, throughout the tasting do you all have to agree in a when you do a release or is it sort of no not necessarily I egg my face. so i love inch cow and, and leon said do you want this inch cow single cast to be um with uk exclusive and i didn't really like it i was like no no i think i said quite horribly i think burn and hell <laughs> <laughs> Um, and anyway, so we gave it to the, we gave it, it was a German exclusive in the end, and I think it's our highest rated whiskey on Whiskey Base. So there we go. Um, so you no, know, we don't have to agree. I think the most important thing, in, and again, because we're working with different distilleries, <coughs> so you're going to be, there's a different flavor. What we want is a James Ely consistency. So it passes. So even if you don't like the distillery character, so for instance, Rupert doesn't like Craig Ellicke, uh, but he can tell, you know, there's no off notes. So to speak. So we're not, you know, there's no harshness. There's all that. There's there's a sort of box that it's got to tick, whether you like the flavors or not. Um, but there's just no dodginess around it. Either. Yeah. You might not like that that flavor, so to speak. So make sure it's all quality controlled. But what do you think about trademark X? Any questions? Well, I always buy. Oh, sorry, John. Well, so we tried the trademark X in a blind tasting. Um, what was it? Be what? A couple of months ago now, Peter. Uh, it was, yeah, it was pretty blind tasting in totally. And Callum, Callum threw it in as a blind drum, didn't he? Um, it was at the mash. Was oh, the, that one. Yeah, so he's done it. He's done it that one. Mash, and um, and it went down really, really well. Um, and that's always a good thing when it's in a blind and no one knows what it is and it still goes down well. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, and it was really when good. we started, because you know I, I was walking around selling the blend. Here in London, it's quite difficult. Up in Scotland, it's not too bad. But we, we used to be at festivals and everyone was, can I try your single more? I was like, oh, do you want to try the blend? I was like, no, don't want to try your blend. So you pour them the blend anyway. And they try to go, oh, that's delicious. And what just is that? And then, and then go, well, fine, I'll try your, try your blend now. And you pour it from the same bottle. And they're like, mm. Some people didn't take it too well, but you know, you've got to challenge ideas. Okay. Um, but it's good that in the blind tasting, it, it, it holds up. And it's just, 
it's just a lovely easy going jam i just i, I personally really enjoy it. obviously people are uh are against blends but what i would say is no matter if it's a grain whiskey or a blend or chill filtered single malt or all that it's still whiskey so if it's good it's good it doesn't matter about the label so that's the other thing because people do have that sort of idea that a old is better which we'll get on to when it comes to consumption um, and i was at a um I was actually at a wine tasting the other day, my first ever one. Um, I like wine, but I'm not, I don't know the, the ins and outs of it, but um, the master of wine there, she gave us a 2018, 2008, and a 1999. And she goes, rather than think about the age, think about what you like to drink. And I really liked the 2018 because it was fruity. I didn't like the 2008 because it was just a bit in between. And then 1999 had a, like a lovely, uh, palette, but it wasn't as flavorful as the 2018. So the same as whiskey, it doesn't matter. But when people say I only drink 25 year old whiskey, it's like, well, you're missing out on amazing whiskey from before then. So yeah, try everything once and then and then um, pick it off, basically. Absolutely. Did you say it was a the, the trade bar packs is a Solera? No, yeah. So we used it. So this, yeah, well, so Norman schooled Rupert. So Rupert is a cook man. He started at McLeod's. Um, he bought Glen Goyne. He, he was director in Clowns and Zell when they bought Glen Goyne. He then moved to Beam uh, when Beam bought out Lefroig and all that. So he's worked for major distilleries and finally he ended up at Diageo. So corporate man, through and through. Uh, so when he came to making the whiskey, so Norman schooled him twice on two things. Uh, first was in the warehouse when they were selecting the cask, whilst Norman was up there nosing them. Uh, and he came across one cask and Norman just knows everything, he doesn't really drink, just knows it. He goes, no, that's off. And Rupert knows, okay, that's absolutely fine. He goes, fine, we'll bring it to the lab and then we'll we'll taste it there. And Norman in the lab gets to it again and goes, well, this is the one that you liked. And then Rupert tried it and it was that off note again. And he was like, well, no, that is actually good. I couldn't tell on those one planet. So Norman said, even if you put that in with the 100 cars that we have, it's going to dilute your quality immediately. And Rupert's like, you can shortly hide it. He goes, no, it'll dilute it. So then Rupert sort of said, oh, okay, it's actually fine. It's, you know, it's your, it's your show. And then it came to blending. So he blended it and he turned to Rupert's like, you need to marry it for six months. And Rupert's like, ah, it's marketing spiel. So we'll just put it in the bottle and let's, let's sell. Uh, and Norman, luckily, because he had the one nail from before, was like, no, trust me. He goes, oh, I trust you. Let's put it in the, in the barrel, back in the barrels to, to marry. And the difference between the unmarried and the married stock is just amazing. Uh, so what we've done now, because sort of was increasing. Uh, we now just put it in like a slurry vat. So it's all marrying at once, um, which is great. It's fantastic. So you've just got this lovely sort of tub of whiskey, so to speak. But uh, the other day when batch four was getting ready, so you've got to top up, obviously, to keep things going. Uh, Leon's on the phone. And all we heard was like, yeah, no, I wouldn't worry about it. That's absolutely fine. I'll talk to him and I'll let him know. But there's nothing we can do. And he put down the phone and Rupert and I looked at each other and like, oh, God, what's happened? And he just burst out laughing. And Rupert's like, what's so funny? He's like, well, I just heard from the blending house that they poured all our little milk, our Tabasco and Lagavulin into the Slayer event. And so obviously, you know, the most expensive ones that you could get your hands on. Um, and then we just had to laugh off because it's still, you know, it's all marrying still. But yeah, now we, you know, I'm wondering that, that will stay for a bit. But we need to go yeah, yeah. I'm doing your teaspooning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it's great because it, it you know it'll be around for ages and you've, you've got this living cask, so to speak, which is which is wonderful. So when so you're bottling your batches, you when you're when batches. you're bottling your batches, do you keep a, a portion in the Solera for the next batch to try and maintain some consistency? Absolutely, I'm a bit like I'm, my uh, my sister started um, in lockdown, did the sourdough. She got into the sourdough craze, so yeah, we leave and you have to have a mother, and that's the same in terms of that vatting. You want to have that sort of mother. And then we keep a cast. We actually have a cask aside of the, the original. So the first one that we made. So we keep on going back to that because you know, we're relying on, on Norman. So Norman, every batch, he goes down and he double checks and he sends the cast of the whiskey and, you know, he's, he's given all the approval. But even Norman will admit that his palate's going to change slightly. But throughout the whole world of whiskey, whether you're drinking Lagrin 16 or Glenfiddich 12, it's all about the master blender trying to bring in that consistency. So it's important to have that sort of footnote for someone to come in. And so if Norman retires and we need to find someone new, then, you know, they'll, they'll try and pair it the same. So 
a lot of people ask me, it's like, now you don't have Lissamil, how are you going to, to recover that? Uh, obviously, we would love to get Lissamil, but it's very difficult. Um, but that's when Norman will come in and basically either find a substitute or add more Avalara, for instance, or, or something to get that flavour. So I'm, I'm sure one of the master blenders could try and create J- trademark X with not all the all the casts because they're that skilled. Um, so does that mean the next couple of batches are going to be really good because they're going to have loads of little milling? Well, because it's got it's got all whiskey in it. Um, <laughs> no, it probably hopefully it all tastes the same. I think that's what that's what um, that's the Norman's Norman's uh, uh, task is to make it taste the same. But it's brilliant. I mean, what we would love to do is recreate this again. If you go on the on the um, uh, on our websites here, it's it, I, I had it after I passed my probation, it's sort of a rite of passage. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. So we'd like to recreate that as well. So that's another thing that we're interested in. But yeah, the whole thing about trademark X is hopefully every time you open the bottle, you get you get what you like, or you get what you know. So. Just talking of blends uh, versus the single malts, obviously there's a general sort of trend at the moment is everything's getting really expensive. Mm-hmm. So that would hopefully give a bit of a gap in the sort of lower mid sort of pricing bracket for some of these blends to actually come through a bit more because the trademark X is a it's a great price. I don't know what we've got it on for, Peter, but I, I, I we've got I, it at 30 quid, so 27 quid. Yeah. Um with your scalp. So that's wow. that's great value, you know, and it and it's, it's really good. It's one that you just it's one that you have in the cupboard all the time. Yeah. I think that's that's also the sort of mentality is with our signals which are limited, so the sort of range from if we do a quarter cast finish to 100, 120 bottles to um, sort of a thousand from the small batch, then when it's gone, it's gone. So what we like is if someone always had the trademark X and then they rotated the single malts um, on their shelves um, for the TMX is that consistent James E.B. on the shelf, so to speak. One thing you can open for your friends, you might hide the single malt in the back or the cupboard <laughs> um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're inclined. Um, but no, it's, it's wonderful. And as I said, it completely opened my eyes to the, the sort of history of blending and how important it, it's been. Yeah, industry. I think it's really good. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Right. So from a, uh, a blend to a whiskey that's known for creating a blend, uh, uh, that's, uh, that was a really good link. I couldn't... That is a very that good was link. a really good link. <sighs> yeah, I think we're trying Blair Athol next. Yeah, well, we are moving on to Blair Athol. So I'm guessing everyone knows it's the heart of Bells. So we're trying... The two whiskies out of the Heart of Bells are, are Blair Athol and, and then Inchgower as well. That's sort of the known as the, the sort of Bells distillery. Um, and so, again, a lot of people, um, when you say, oh, Blair Athol's the Heart of Bells, sort of lights go out in their eyes because they're like, oh, Bells, it's not very nice. Well, so we actually, we had a, um, a, t- a team Christmas party pre-COVID back then. Uh, and Rupert was like, right, I'm going to test if you actually know what you're doing. And it was after a nice long supper and at this pub and he came out with five whiskey. He said, try them all and select your favourite. So Leon and I sit through them and we pointed to the second one and we but first at half it's like that's the bells. So we out of like McCallum, uh, I think there was an open 14, we we chose the bells uh, in the blind tasting. So going back to that whole blind tasting. So yeah, but Blair Athol uh, is a wonderful distillery. Uh, here, uh, I sadly don't have any of the labels on me, but it's part of our small batch. Now, if you tried one of our small batches before, they were the white label. Um, so our small batch that came out last year, um, they were the labels were painted by Rupert's wife, Annabelle. Uh, and you see there were animals or, or sort of acorns and everything. And the reason why that was is we linked everything back to what James E.D. Uh, was doing um, we decided to link our small batch labels to the pubs he used to own so as I mentioned before we had 250 pubs so um, each release or each line of our small batch is dedicated to one of his pubs now this one is dedicated to the seven stars um, I've got the Manic Moore 11 year which is dedicated to the Rise of Sun but to show you the sort of font it's, it's done by um, uh, Christina who is a lovely Italian designer uh, so this year she's doing our labels so here she chose the Celestials. So this is the Mount Moore Rising Sun. But if you do uh, see um, the Blair Athol, it's a, a lovely sort of nod to, to, to the history. So I think it's dedicated to the seven stars that was bought in 1890 and it was in Derby. So on the back of our label, we tell you everything. Um, and on the front, we tell you what the whiskey's made of. But this Blair Athol is a 10-year-old and it's had two refill hogsheads and one first fill bourbon barrel. 
Uh, now, with the small batch range, we tend to use three casts. We say anything between two to four casts. And what we're trying to do there is bring you to still character. So a um, few people might have not tried Blair Africa before. So what we uh, want to do with the small batch is show these hidden gems or these blending ones, so to speak, um, and give you that distillery character. And so we use, we tend to use refill, uh, so two refill, and then one either first fill or recharge um, hogshead. Now the refills, because there's been less obviously flavor in, in, impacted by the wood there, is sort of the, the raw distillery character. Uh, and then we use the first fill to bring it into that sweetness to sort of, sort of balance it out. So Norman doesn't do the small batches. Uh, that's between Rupert, uh, Leon and I, and there's no, method to the madness it's car sample and then you just try and pair them up so you, you know each one individually this one's a bit meaty this one's a bit ultra fruity and this one's got lovely sort of sweetness to it why don't we try those together there you are so because you're working with three casts rather than 20 you don't really you get more of an in, individual aspect to those cars so i think as soon as you go over 20 that's where the silly character really starts playing but what we're trying to do is pick those different essences of that distillery and put it into one bottom. So a bit like a, a lovely jigsaw that um, after sort of trying 50 samples, it's quite difficult to know. But it's, um, yeah, it's something that we want to give. So going back to that history of blending, it's showing you why blenders use Blair Athol. So Blair Athol traditionally very meaty, and I, I personally think orchard fruits. And it's one of my favorite to do. So it's also UK exclusive. So that meant that I fought tooth and nail uh, with Rupert to get this for the UK market because uh, he looks after the majority of exports and I look after UK, Canada and Sweden. So every time we divvy up the spreadsheet that Leon's got for us, uh, we, we decide and after trying this, I was adamant on, on, on it being the UK exclusive because it's, I love Blair Athol. I love that sort of meaty type of malt. Uh, and I think you really get that here. And now, the reason it's it's like that is because of the way distillery the, the distillery is, is made. So it's got short dump distills, um, which means there's less copper contact and has a nice long ferm fermentation. So it gets more it's a bit estuary uh, rather than liquid, which is another probably a bit of polar opposite to, to Blair Apple is more of that light style. So again, out of the well, I think it's like about 125 distilleries, all every single distillery, whether they're next door to each other, has that own independent mark which a blender wants and so again Blair Athol's in the in the trademark X um, and Norman says it's just a wonderful base mold basically because you're getting that, that those music notes and then you're going to pair it with your smoky ones um, and for us Blair Athol is sort of our guinea pig Blair Athol and Ben Rennes is our guinea pig so when we do cast finishes uh, when we started them about four years ago um, Blair Athol uh, Ben Rennes and Dal Yearn were the first series that we used because if they can't stand up to the the wood finish then Nothing else will because it's got that huge personality in that, that body. So uh, Blair Apple is one that we keep working with and we absolutely love. Now, has anyone been to Blair Apple? Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's a beautiful area. It's up in Pit Lockery. Yep. Um, uh, which is, yeah, it's lovely. A lot of like walk, if you like your walking and all that. And there's edge dowels around, around, around there as well. So if you ever uh, want to staycation, so to speak, I highly advise going there and, and pop around and see. Uh, Blair Apple. Now you would probably think it is a Bell's distillery because Bell, the Bell's man is sort of listed all over it. Um, but it's a fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic distillery. Um, yeah, you can buy every every incarnation of a Bell's bottle. Yeah, buy the oh, yeah. twenty four minis in a pack and all that sort of stuff. Well, the guy that actually did our tour was saying he started the, the tour by saying. Yes, we are one of the main components of Bells, and we are proud of that because it's a very good selling whiskey. However, that is the last time I will mention Bells on this tour. Yeah. And the rest was all about the single malt character. Um, it's a really good tour, actually. Yeah, it's a brilliant tour. <coughs> but it's, yeah, it talks to Norman about it. It's just one of his favorite whiskies to work with. Um, yeah, he's pretty, not scathing or something, but he's like, no, you don't need that one. And it's quite interesting because he's been around when these distilleries closed down and now they're getting reopened. He's a bit on. Doing that, <laughs> 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 no, you could you you know you you got a perfectly good Ben Rennes around the corner, or why don't you just use that? So um yeah, Blair Athol is one of our sort of base malts in our blend, which means it's one of the one of the main malts that we use. Um, and then the top dressers, which is the one that you sprinkle on a bit of seasoning, are are um are 
lack of really internal screen and that sort of stuff. But I think only out of the 100 class, I think only eight of them repeated, going back to Trainwork X. Yeah. So okay. again, even getting that smoke from Trainwork X isn't coming from a lot of cars. Uh, but what do you think of this Blair Athel? Good. I love it. I'm a Blair Athel fanboy, so yeah. I love this one. I tried this one last week at the uh, the MASH. It was, yeah, really solid, yeah. good quality Blair Athel. Steve, what do you think of it? I like it very much. It's got a nice glow to it at the end. Mm. Just keeps that warmth in your mouth. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it holds on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's got good texture. That's what you're saying about it being sort of meaty. It's got that weight, the spirit, the weight of the spirit is good. The Blair Athels I've had previously, I think, have pretty much all been uh, ex sherry matured. So mm. it's really interesting to sort of try it like this, you know, without that sort of coating, if you like. Mm. And so you probably get a bit more of the reflection of the true distillery character rather than it being covered in sherry. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm very much sort of on an ex-bourbon sort of thing at the moment. And so this is this is ticking boxes for me. So it's good. Yeah, I like it. It's so quality. It's, like it's, it's great showing, yeah, it's in, the, in bourbon cost as well. Because mm. as you say, I think the, is the flora and fauna in sherry as well. Is that one in sherry? So. Margot, are you drumming as well, or are you just are you still working and listening? I am. Well, no, I finished this. Um, this is the bottle I bought, and I'm quite happy with the Blair Apple. I have to admit. And actually, I might be going to visit the distillery at the end of July. Mm. So, just excellent. To pick the ones we're going to do. Brilliant. So, so you bought the Blair Apple as, as part of this? I one. did. Oh, I good. Did. And I'm quite That's happy. That's one for one. We're now to move on to Stephen as Craig Ellicke. <laughs> Sorry, I have oh, a... I'll, can I show you this one? That, uh, I can't. Which one's that? Yeah. In the 11 Manicmore PX, yeah. Now, did I get that at the show? Yes, you did. You came up to me and asked me where it was, and I was like, it's in the container, Steve, but you can pay for it if you want. <laughs> yeah. That was, I think, yeah, that Manicmore was, um, again, well, I'm sure if you opened up and showed the colour. Well, that's the one I tasted at the show, and I thought it was really good. One of the best ones I've... I've tried at the show, so yeah. you got that man, that's why I got it. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Well, we'll talk about consumption a bit, but yeah, it's working. It's working with those um, with small batches, working with distilleries, and making sure you get that distillery character. Whilst when you move on to the cast finish, um, that's more opinion specific. But the most important thing is to still keep the distillate alive. It's not oversharing it with, with the sharing cast. So it's getting that balance. But we'll talk about that on whiskey number five. So we are moving on to Craig Ellicke next, I think. Yeah, we're moving on to the Craig Ellicke. I've just had a quick sniff of that, and that smells amazing. Yeah, funky. 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 Uh, so the Craig oh, Ellicke, yeah. a, again, a different a different label. So this one's dedicated to the New Star um, pub. Um, so again, just sort of linking everything back. Uh, but it's our first Craig Ellicke that we bottled uh, as a small batch. We did one cast finish for export. Um, and so when we looked at the, the casks, um, we had three single casks, obviously, uh, all refill uh, and at cast strength. And we tried them individually. Um, and the nose on them, it just smelled like onions in a good way. But all of them just had this like real funkiness. And so when we had the Craig Ellicke, so, oh, this would be really good as a, you know, why don't we cast finish the three or why don't we um, just, you know, leave them as a single cast? And we tried them and go, oh, God, yeah, that's, that's quite potent and quite intense. And some people, you know, some people love Craig Ellicke, um, so they would have lapped it up. But um, what we decided to do is flat them together again in the glasses and we diluted it down. And then just the nose and everything completely changed into this lovely, funky uh, nose that you have here. Uh, all our small batches are bottled at 46%. I should, should have mentioned that. Um, so what we found, and whilst tasting it, if you try it at 46% and then add water, you see it, it still changes the more water you add. So it sort of becomes a bit more mellow in that sense. But what you get with Craig Ellicke is, is that wonderful funkiness. Um, some bit, I think it's a bit like Marmite. Uh, some people either absolutely love Craig Ellicke or they can't stand it. Uh, I'm very much the side that loves it. I think it's a really fascinating put out there um single malt uh, again but this is bottled at 13 so like the the official release um but you get sort of i shouldn't really say taste notes but what i got is that savory sweetness so sort of white chocolate with um sort of those those 
Bovril and those sort of meaty notes. So it's, it's quite a strange sort of mixture, but mm. I think it stands up really well by itself. Um, and hopefully we could work with more Craig Delicky because it's, it's a fascinating um, distillery. Um, but here again, just three refill casks. So no first fill because um, we, we had the refills and we just thought it was an amazing uh, sort of example of what Craig Elke is about. I mean, if you look at your glass, it's all completely filled with colour, obviously, because it's just come from 13 years of, of refill rather than the first one. Um, but so I was pouring out, I was pouring out a tasting the other day and the ones I did were Tremark X, Blair Ath, and I was just pouring out the Craig Elke and someone came and was like, oh, it's a white wine tasting and turned away. <laughs> And then they came back. <laughs> like, oh no, it is wine. It is whiskey tasting. Really sorry about that. Um, so it's got that sort of like straw colour to it. Uh, but again, unadulterated sort of really raw natural Craig Ellicky with just three casks. Um, um, and it's yeah for me, it's a it's a lovely go to. I think with the small batches, we want it to be. We don't want it to be too punchy. We don't want it to be too out there. We want it to be that stupid character. And I think again, it. It ticks boxes. So going back to what I said at the start, you may not like the flavour, but I, as I said, Rupert didn't like this one. But he was like, "There's no real off notes. There's no like harsh burn or anything. It's got. It's just that funky distillery." Okay. I think I'm with Rupert a little bit on this. The, yeah. the initial nose of it is. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with that. I've got to be honest. Um, but once it's on the palate, it actually improves dramatically. And the, again, I like the texture and the weight of it on the palate. Um, but that initial nose is something that I, I do I struggle with. Uh, Craig Ellie, they're, they're, I think they they have part of their character is that sort of quite sulfurous note, isn't it? And they do they specify. I think they're, they're when they get their barley malted, they actually specify higher sulfur compounds in their in their uh, barley, which adds to that character. And uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm 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 funny with with sulfur. Sometimes I'm really susceptible to it, and it, it really does sort of turn me off a little bit. Um, and this is sort of borderline for me. Yeah, and with the long fermentation as well, it sort of just adds to all that. Mm. A lot of funkiness going on. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah like, you're right. It's... The quality obviously is there, and the, and say the texture's good. It's just on the nose that, like, say that, like, say it's a bit of a marmite thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, I'm struggling with it, I've got to be honest. Well, has it helped you get rid of your cold? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe that's part of the reason I'm struggling with it, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but if, again, if you just keep on adding water, it's amazing. It's out of, out of the ones that we're trying today, it changes the most when you add water. Um, so the, the, that sulfur note does sort of uh, dissipate a little bit once you've had it on, in your palate. Mm. And we'll put some water, a few drops of water on it and see what it's like. Um, Yeah, it's one of the, I think it's because it's there now, and I know it's there. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, when we um, yeah, when we tried the the single cast versions of them, it was punchy. Steve, what do you think? Well, I I like it. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's different. I've never tried it before. Uh, I was going between the Blair Apple or this for the tasting, and, and uh, I've had Blair Apple before, so I thought I'd give this a go and. I'm glad I did, actually. Oh, so have you <laughs> tried Craig, Del Craig, Del or no. Craig Delacky before? No, first time. First time, so um, yeah, I'm rather rather pleased. Good. I, I, I agree with John on the nose. It's, it's unusual. It's un very unusual, yeah. I, I did. When you said onions in that, I, get, I can imagine that. I'm not saying it does smell of onions, yeah. but I can see where that comes from. Um, I think one of them from Rupert was um, sweaty socks. <laughs> I know what sweaty socks are like, so it's not like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it's very funky. Water does make it more fruity. It brings out more of the fruit character with, with water. It's one that takes really well to water. Yeah, and it's not not really sort of damage the palate. Sometimes when you add <laughs> water, it can completely destroy the texture. But that doesn't. It's uh, that stands up pretty well. <clears throat> It's a little bit pickled on your monster munch on the nose, I think. That, yeah. that was Liam. That was that was Liam. Um, Which is a good. I mean, give me a worm tub and a sulfury whiskey. I'm a happy man. So Craig Ellick is very much one of my sort of whiskies. 
as, as you said, the, the worm tub. So they're doing everything they can to basically not have that much copper contact. <laughs> <laughs> Don't filter out our sulfur. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the first things that goes in it during the distillation process is when any sulfurous compounds hit that copper that just disappears, doesn't it? Yeah, because that's, that's why I think mm. all the stills are made out of copper because of that. I mean, you can imagine back in the day when they were distilling, it must have been pretty pretty intense sulfur. Mm. I mean, it's amazing how people react to sulfur. It's like, um, we did a, a canvas 24-year-old in Sherry single cast, and everyone was delicious. Everyone thought it was delicious, and then... This guy came up to me, he was like, it tastes like eggs. It tastes like gone off eggs. It's disgusting. And you're like, wow, that's your reaction to sulfur. Like, yeah. Yeah. Margot, what did you think of this one? Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit distracted because I have a US tax filing deadline and I can't download oh. stuff. And I'm so I've been working on this for three days. So oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, I really don't want the IRS coming after me. No, probably um, not. <laughs> But, you know, unlike Edge MRC, IRS actually carried guns. Maybe not in this country. <laughs> uh, but this one, I know I quite like it. It does make me a little bit more calm trying to deal with the tax situation. Um, but yeah, it is, it, it definitely is funny. I can't quite place it because it doesn't taste like a Craig Ellicky I've tried before, but you can kind of have the, the traces in there. So um, yeah, I think I liked it. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> it's one of those. It, yeah, I haven't. I'm sort of sitting on a fence. It is not one of these slap you in the face. It is one of those. It's really interesting, and I and I want my palate to to sort of mosey over it. Yeah, it's a thinker. That is it. It is a thinker. It's a thinker. Huh? But yeah, it's got a a nice tingy. I don't, I don't know another word for it, but sort of tingly taste when it on the palate. Yeah, quite sour. But I'm not, yeah, a bit sour, but I'm not getting a lot of flavors, but I'm getting something very pleasant. Mm. And that is my summary. Sorry, I I will give you my full attention because I've just given up. I've emailed back the- No, no, I don't, want, I don't want the IRS. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want you to get arrested. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do because they gave me three phone numbers and they don't answer any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that is just like HMRC. Yes, that definitely is, yeah. <laughs> Right. right, so um, are we now going into some cast strength yeah. territory with Glenn Dullen? Glenn Dullen, yeah. So um, when with our um, uh, single cast, cast strength, um, well, definitely cast strength, uh, it's a black label. So black label comes with a warning. Okay. Um, so again, I don't have any bottles with me. So um, cast finish, it will be a black label. Uh, with a, a, a twinge of colour at the bottom, just to, and it tells you what it's been finished in. While well, single cast is just a black label, um, so yeah, our, our black label is basically in warning its cast strength. Um, so the Glen Dunn twelve year old, uh, this is bottled only at fifty two point six percent, but it is cast strength. Um, so quite low ABV for for what people expect to be a cast strength. But for me, this was the the real big surprise. Uh, when it came to sort of after everything got bottled and we were trying it. Uh, again, it's a UK exclusive. Uh, and Glen Dullin is a distillery that I didn't really know much of because it tends to be in the Singleton range, which gets sold out to even America. I think Glenn goes to Asia. Um, so they have specific markets. So you don't really see it by itself. But again, it's it's used in, in all those benefits. I think it produces about 3.7 million litres of alcohol a year. Uh, and it's sort of heading towards the big Diageo. Uh, blends and, and 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 probably more ones outside Diageo as well, but it's a lovely. Like I would I would try and describe it as like a classical space. I don't know that there's a lot of different flavors coming from that space. I but you're getting those fruity sweet notes um, coming through. And and for me, in a world of cherry bombs, so that Manic Mall uh, PX that you've got there, Steve, is, is definitely a cherry bomb. This is a bourbon bomb. And it's only spent twelve years in first world bourbon, and, and you can really tell it. Um, and it's got just that lovely sort of creaminess coming through um, to it as well. But it's a, it's a fantastic distillery. Again, love to sort of work for it. It's it's, it's on the on the Fiddick uh, River, 
which is obviously very famous for Glen Piddick, and it's just outside Duff Town. Um, sort of hidden away, one still that not a lot of people know of. Um, so to show it as just a first Phil Bourbon, 12 years old, is, is, is a sort of a, a, a great uh, privilege for us to be able to do tonight. Um, but yeah, for me, it's it stole my heart straight away. I was I love I love the costumes that we're doing. They're all very exciting. Uh, but a lot of people, so they look at the small batch and they like the sort of the value for money. And they look at the cast just because they think it's interesting. But actually, when we bottle a single cask, it's because we think it's really interesting and a bit a bit out there uh, as well. Uh, and I think this Glenn Dullin is just an absolute winner. So they tend to sell slow the, the single cask, but they sort of build a, a bit of a reputation. But here you get those big bourbon vanillins and, and creaminess and it's just uh it's just for me it's uh the go-to I, I would say out of, out of this spring release um you could go you could have it in winter you could have it in summer uh, again i i do recommend uh diluting it i personally like it just at 52.6 but if you're getting a bit of a lot of abv you no know, it's, it's lovely when you dilute it as well but i think for 52 percent it's it's quite phenomenal it doesn't really taste like it dangerously it doesn't taste I think the ABV is sort of really good where it is. Mm. I think that, that that sort of lowish 50s is actually a really good sort of, mm. when you get, I suppose, when well, I mean, we're all sort of pretty used to drinking whiskey now and drinking like cast strength things and higher ABV things. And so, to you know, obviously at one, one sort of time, it had to be sort of at minimum 43%, then it was 46 now everything probably has to be 50-ish. And yeah. now sort of, you know, this sort of this sort of 50, 52, 53 sort of range, mm. I think is it's what it gives you, it gives you the concentrated flavours that you're looking for, but it's still quite approachable. It's not blowing your head off at sort of 60%. It's, yeah. you know, it's it's giving you everything that you want in that. And it's just the, the again, the textures are always good with the higher ABVs, I find as well, or certainly better. Um, when things get watered down, they tend for me tend to lose that texture, which is a really important part. You know, my enjoyment and experience of, of the drums. This is this is really doing it for me. I, I love those sort of um, ice and sugar, sort of almost lemon bonbon type powder sort of notes on it, and those sort of things are great. I, I think this is lovely. Yeah, good job. Yeah. Well, I think you just you hit the nail on the head. That it's everything. There's nice ABV. It's yeah, ice and sugar is, a, is another great one. It's just a lovely sort of bourbon, fruity space side. Um, I don't know why it was at 50 percent because you know you think the fill would be about 60 percent. So I don't know why it lost eight percent over uh, 12 years. Um, maybe it was just quite high up in the in the old warehouse and it just evaporated a bit more. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, it's nice ABV to go there. And what I really enjoy about the single cast range uh all the car strength range you're in control of what you like so when you first open it obviously your, your mood changes but when you first open it you can work out how many drops you need and i think ralphie's a big one of that because he's got his teaspoon and he knows exactly how many drops he's doing and he sort of measures it out so it allows you to control what you want from your whiskey so i always think car strength is great um i remember when we try our our car strength stuff because everything all our samples come in car strength all our car samples so after the fifth one, because I don't really dilute, but I dilute it down for professional courtesy to sort of find out, you know, the flavours, not always trying stuff. But I think it was about the double checking of them after they got bottled. I think I tried six car strengths and Rupert's like, you can't tell the difference between them now. You've completely burned your taste buds. It's like, no, it's fine. I can tell the difference of every single one. And I think he put one in front of me. He's like, that's definitely the Glendale. He's like, no. That's the man at more. Like, okay, I'm going to I'll put them away now. Uh, but I love car strength. Whilst Rupert likes and water and, and, and that. But I think with car strength as well, if you sit and you're watching TV or um, it just sort of, over time, it just gets nicer and nicer in, in the glass. So you can leave, you can sit and wait. Um, so we... Any other thoughts on that, Steve, Margot? Good. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of bourbon fill. So this I, I, I absolutely love this. Mm. Um, it has that lovely creaminess that that I really like. I'm fine with the ABV. I'm you know with John, you know, why why dilute something? It's just perfect as it is. 
interesting. Yeah, I, I, this is really lovely. It's a lovely color as well. I know you, there's, yeah, there's the there's, color there's, doesn't really matter when it comes to this, but yeah, no, it does. It it's, looks proper. It, yeah, it's really nice. There's no sitting on a fence for me on this one. No. Steve? Um, I think it's really nice. Yes, I love it. It's um, got a nice depth of flavor again. Um, you've all disappeared off my screen, so I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to find you. <laughs> You're winging it. I can see you. Um, my screen's gone blank completely. <laughs> I haven't even got the arrow on my mouse. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. We can see you, Steve, though. We can see you and hear you. No pressure. <laughs> Well, I'll sit at looking at this mic screen then. <laughs> no, I, I, that makes it taste more um, enjoyable. That is a very good whiskey, yes. Mm. Very nice. As you say, you could enjoy that watching a film. Could enjoy quite a lot of that watching a film. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's, yeah. No problem. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you probably won't remember what film we watched. No. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well. You nearly came back, man. Oh. You nearly came. Yeah. Nearly, he's gone again. You're having a seance. We're in the room with you. Yeah. yeah. Speak. You want to sit and come back again? That's always my solution is, oh, it's not working. I'll just leave and come back. <laughs> they won't know. No. Okay, so, yeah, I'm moving. around here. <laughs> moving from the small batch up to the single cask, um, you do see that sort of, Obviously, not the difference in quality because all very good, but you, that there's a different side to whiskey as soon as you get into that car strength. Um, so it's great doing the, these different ranges and showcasing what whiskeys um, like across across the board uh, as well. We do do um, uh, some single grain car strength stuff as well, which is brilliant. Love old grain, um, so do keep an eye out for, for what's to come uh, in our single car strength as well. But as I said, the unsung heroes, the single cast. And actually got two of them today. Um, but we, we'll move on to one of our cast finishes. So we did two cast finishes, and the inch count is obviously one of two of them. Is everyone all right, or are you all still nursing your Glen Dunn and you're all quite enjoying it? You don't want to move on just yet. Always happy to have another whiskey. Always happy to have another whiskey. Are you right for time as well? What time would you like it to? No, no, we're, we're fine for time. Yeah. Fine. So John, is that is that bourbon bomb got rid of your cold? It's certainly helping. It's helping. Good, good. Yeah, it's no, it's really good. That Glendon's lovely. Yeah. Not had a lot of Glendon, and that's really sort of creamy and sherbetty and just rather lovely, to be mm. honest. Yeah, it's a, it's a rather lovely whiskey. I think. That's yeah. a way to, to put it. And that's one of those hidden gems, isn't it? I think it's the when you when you see it, and you don't see it very often. I've had a couple of um, independent some sort of. Again, single cask, Glendorns, and they've all been really good. Mm. All been really good. That's just no different. We're trying to get our hands on more. That's just really, mm. really nice. Because we did a nine-year-old small batch last year. I don't know if you remember, it was the Black Swans. Uh, and that's yeah, absolutely delicious. Again, yeah. all the notes that you're trying here. Uh, that was two refills and one first fill. Bourbon. Everyone happy to move on to the inch count? Everyone got there? Yeah, let's go for it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is part of our cast finish range. So cast, our cast finish range stems from sort of Leon's uh, research of the ledgers. So um, Leon is sort of the head of, uh, or director of operations, so I say, or brand director. Uh, and his background, he is a history buff. So he loves researching, basically, and he loves revising everything. So he has scanned through all the ledgers uh, of James E.D. Uh, and he noticed that he kept on marking, he had certain marks of certain casks. So he went to Rupert and he said, well, you know, I've, uh, through my research, I know what cask he's finishing. And, and basically James finished in all types of sherry, uh, Madeira, uh, Masala, uh, and then some Malaga casks and everything like that as well. So being a Victorian uh, bro, he basically got his hands on anything that was empty. But he didn't do port finishing, so we can't do port finishing. So we only finish in casks that he used to mature his whiskies in. Um, so it took Rupert a bit of time to come around to it, because Rupert's very much a traditionalist. First of all, refill bourbon, don't mess around with it. I definitely when it comes to islands, I just leave all islands in refill and you've just got 
heaven and the glass there. So it took a bit of persuading and it sort of you know, showcased because we don't control uh, the distillate, um, we sort of buy the cast and the cast that are in. So this is the sort of first, um, this is the part that we can start influencing it and, and, and putting our own stamp on it. So uh, Leon, drew up the cast. So if we start, why don't we just start with, you know, Oleros and PX and the usual stuff uh, and go from there. But from there, we've now got a lovely catalogue um, uh, building. So this has been finished for 37 months. So um, when it comes to finishing, there isn't a set, there's no exact science. It's not like everything is finished for six months or if it's in the first fill at six months and the refill is 12, uh, 12 months, uh, it's when it's ready. Um, so the big thing for us is if it's all about the distillery character and it's getting the balance between that wood influence and a distillery character. So um, we were talking about sort of old whiskies, um, but for us, we've got this nice pendulum. If you see me, I'm trying to go all the way back and you've got distillery character here and then you've got uh, wood influence over here. Now, if you bottle something a bit too young, it'd be sort of down here. And it's a bit too raw and the, the sort of balance between wood and just hasn't come in. And if you bottle something too old, it's going to be sort of over here. And then you're just getting all those oaky notes and it doesn't really taste like whiskey. It can be delicious. Uh, so what we want to do is get it right bang in the middle. Um, and obviously it's quite difficult to do that, but we check our cast every three months just to make sure they're all behaving. Um, and, you know, we're not putting things in. It's all like, oh, let's put it into like a first of all PX. So it's going to be pitch black. We, we don't control that. That's all like anything that comes out dark. It's just lucky. I mean, a few people do ask, like, can we have one of your dark whiskies as an exclusive? Like, well, we, we don't really know how to do it. I mean, the only thing you're guaranteed is if you put into a first of all cast, then you're guaranteed a sort of pitch black whiskey uh, within two months or two weeks. Uh, but so for us, it's all about getting into the middle. Uh, so this uh, took 37 months. And I remember when we were checking it and it was just one of those where you're like, oh, it's just not quite ready. Or have we over matured it? Has it gone too far uh, in it? Because usually, you know, the rule of thumb is with refill stuff, it takes probably two years. Uh, and then eventually when we tried it after sort of 32 months, we were just like, oh, it's here, it's arrived. You've still got that lovely um, inch gap. And then you've also got this, lovely Oloroso influence on it, but it's not overpowering. It doesn't mask the sort of the wonderful distillery that is, um, that is Inchgau. And it's one of my favorite distilleries, even though I, I told that story before that I didn't want that single cast when I went to Germany and it's gone down like a treat. Uh, I just love it because it's got this wonderful saltiness. Uh, so Inchgau is another space side. So we've tried three space sides in a row uh, and it's just got, it's up, up in Bucky, which, you know, it's on the coast. So I'm not going to say because it's on the coast, it's salty, but it has this wonderful sort of saltiness and, and sweetness to it. Uh, and working, now we've been doing it for four years, we're trying to pair um, casts with that distillate. So I've said, I said before, when we first saw that, it was Ben Rinn and Stal Ewan uh, and um, Blair Athel, because they're the meaty ones. So you can chuck them in anything. But now it's trying to pair. So we did a inch gallon Amontillado, which for me was one of our top tiers that we've ever bottled. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and Oloroso, refill Oloroso tends to work really well as well. So it has that longer maturation. And so with Oloroso notes, they tend to be that nutty side of things. And so adding that into the sort of the, the distillery character of, of inch gallon just works out um, really well. And for me, we did an all thrust that uh, was finished the first fill, Oloroso Hogshead. Um, which is a bit darker in colour. Again, it doesn't matter, but it's got more of those juicier notes coming through. Uh, so I was initially, when we tried that as a car sample, I was like, oh, that's absolutely delicious. And then since it's been bottling, this is the one that I keep on going back to because you've got that toffee, lovely sort of sweetness, but it's not sickly sweet. It's just got that lovely sort of balance that Oloros has really just come in. And, you know, it's a wonderful 37-month fi finish, I think. A lot of people who criticise cast finishing think it's, oh, you're just trying to mask, you're trying to mask a bad distillate with a, like a really overactive cast, and it's not about that uh, at all. Because as Norman said, back when Rupert wanted that cast to go into his blends, like, you can't mask good a bad whiskey. It will come out in the wash eventually. So it's all about getting, getting those pairs right. And obviously the distillate's very important, but if the distillate is amazing and you put it in bad wood, it'd be ruined. And if the distillate's all awful and you put it in good wood, it's, it, it won't matter. It will, it will still be bad. So that's why the distillate's so important. And we're just trying to sort of bring out an interesting side to 
or an interesting flavour that still represents that distillery character. So, uh, yeah, I love the cast finishing. It's, it's great fun. It gets a bit tedious when you're playing football on a Tuesday and you're trying to temp cast sample before you go play right wing. Um, but it, it, it's amazing just to see the development of that cast and that cast impact. And obviously, through the great work of Dr. Jim Swan, we know a lot more about maturation and, and how important it is. But, yeah, just, you can't rush it. It's just looking after it the whiskey in uh and within itself the three month the three year finish it could be a whiskey in itself but again it's not overpowered it's just a lovely sort of balance and, and a great whiskey and bottle at 56.7 percent as well so it's just a nice overall not a sherry bomb but just a sherry influenced so when you do the this the obviously the sampling every three months if you feel like it's getting near would you sample it more often or it's sort of a three month window, sort of a sort of a generic time where you know it's not going to change too much within three. It, yeah, months. We, we hope it won't change too much. Mm. I mean, again, if you leave it for three months in a in a quarter cast, then it's going to be completely different. Yeah. So now we're about to select our September release. So we we've gone through the testing and we go well. We think these are the ones ready, but we're not going to taste them now to choose them in September. We've got to get that time right. So so Liam was on the phone to me. Um, Today and he was just like, I'm not going to get it down in two weeks, but we we start need to look at it at sort of the end of July and then move pretty quickly on the bottling on that because you don't want to leave it within within that. Um, How long is it from when you say cask is ready to it going in the bottle? I mean, is it pretty much immediate, or I mean, I would imagine it takes a bit of time to get the logistics working. Yeah, so the, in fact, thank God I don't do logistics. So as I said, I'm <laughs> for that. Um, so Leon puts it into the bottle and I just go out and, and sell it. But uh, I think the logistics, I think Leon said he's lost a lot, a lot more hair since he started this job. Um, but because they're in different warehouses, so we don't store, we don't have our own warehouse, we use other warehouses uh, across the country. So it's then finding out where they are and then getting people to deliver it to the bottling hall. Uh, but it should be within... You, you put your bottling date in and then you run towards that. Okay. So, so, so you have to account for that little bit of extra time when you're thinking about the tasting and the aging uh, of, right, it's going to take me, you know, 15, 30 days. Mm, it's going to be ready in that time versus yeah, I'm, I'm, what you do. You know how you did your little. Uh, yeah. So you move it into, <laughs> you move it into a plastic container for it to be yeah. transported. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. So as soon as it gets out, it's, it's no longer maturing. Um, so, okay, so you, know, like, you like move it wine. into a separate container. No, right. you can move it into a separate container. So okay. we did actually, um, we had an inch count again. Um, I think it was a single cask. And this before I joined, but there's a case in uh, in the office that has gin wrist on it. I was like, do we have bottle gin? He goes, no. Basically, we had the single <laughs> cask inch count and we were trying it. It was one of the first that we've ever were going to release. Um, and Rupert's son goes, and he was working for, for a gin company at the time, goes, this really reminds me of a gin. And then everyone suddenly picks up the notes. And so the, Leon phones up the warehouse and goes, uh, we're getting some gin notes, like the heavy juniper notes on our uh, inch can. Um, what container did you put it in? And someone said, oh, we put it into a gin container that hadn't been washed out. So then it's, it's now called Ginch Gower. <laughs> but you can't, you can't you can drink it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's like, it's like 250 it's bottles just gone because the, yeah. the, 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 um, the container hadn't been washed out, so there are moments where that happens. But yeah, but you get compensation for that then, Q. If, if they make a mistake like that, do you get compensation? If they yeah, I think yeah, our next bottling run could be a lot cheaper. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> again, don't do all that side of it. Um, yeah, when, but you can't I move casks. So because it's going to be under bonds, you can't really move casks. Oh, I like see. That and as soon as it's out of the cask, it no longer develops. Yeah. So you do want to get out. And there's only a few places that have their own bottling facilities on site. So you're generally moving it. Yeah, you're generally moving it. Yeah. So I, I'm not a huge sherry fan, as, as people on this call will know, but I actually like this one because it isn't a sherry bomb. It's It has that sherry undertones, but it doesn't over overload my senses. And so, you mm. know, I, I have that light flavor, but it, it just... It hits that right note. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for those who know how much I'm not a sherry bomb person, that's a, a massive compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't hate it. Oh, it's a huge compliment. <laughs> no, no, no. no it, 
like it. No, 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 no. The fact that I like it. It's yeah. because there's a lot of sherry uh, whiskey that I'm like, oh, I don't hate it. And, and I probably will go back to sherry whiskeys eventually. I'm just in this, you know, your taste change over time. Um, but this one I like. And so that's why I'm saying you've done very well because you've taken somebody who's not a huge fan of sherry, mm-hmm. given them a whiskey that despite or, or because it's sherry actually comes across really well because it doesn't overwhelm the senses. It's not too sweet. It's not so overwhelming. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and definitely the, the sweetness, the really sweet stuff uh, is PX. So certain sherries, you know what you can get in PX. It can be yeah. really sweet. Um, yeah. But what we're moving on to, we're not moving on to, but the ones that we really enjoy working with are Almontiade and Palo Cotale, that's wonderful maturations. Um, so that those add, you know, they're not your cl- classic sherry, they're slightly drier. Um, yeah. And it's just, oh, as I said before, Coley and Palo Cotale is just an absolute match in heaven. And actually, Inchgau and Almontiade was amazing oh. as well, because they're, they're that a lot ch- salty as well. So they add that sort of thing. I, yeah, I like the saltier. And, and and not so sweet the more dry sherry yeah uh, it's, it's great uh but yeah it's again so as i said we did a first fill uh all uh, uh all frost in the first fill oloroso hogshead and this is a refill oloroso but so again bigger you know bigger cast i got i got d in gcse chemistry so i'm not going to try and explain it all but obviously you know more or less surface area, less contact basically with the wood, and, yes. and it's a refill, not a first one. So again, going back to what I said, we're releasing different styles of whiskey, so hopefully there's one for you. So it's great that you you like this refill. If I had the all for us first fill, yeah, you're probably like that. No, that's that's too rich. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's your entry back into sherry. Yeah, now I do better with the sherry hogshead than a, than a a full sherry, but. I mean, I'm, I'm still a fan of it going farkless just because they do it so well. Mm. You got the one responsible for breaking in there. Sorry? <laughs> you got the one responsible for breaking into the distillery there. <laughs> no, I don't know that much. <laughs> but my brother actually sent me an email. He said, so where were you last night? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so quickly with our finishing, we only use refill cast first. So this spent nine years in a refill cost and then we moved it in. Yeah. Uh, I did say to Rupert once, like, why don't we move from first fill into first fill bourbon into a first fill sherry or even more, I went, why don't you move into a refill sherry from a refill sherry into a first fill bourbon? He's like, no, nah, it's just too weird. So I'm <laughs> still baby steps. <laughs> um, but yeah, the cast finish rate, it, it coughs up some lovely and unique uh, flavors, but what we want is that stereo character make sure everyone still enjoys the whiskey for what it is rather than a show. I mean, we have had moments, and I think, Steve, your Manic Moore PX was the first one that we bottled and we were like, crazy, that is pitch black. Um, and I think it was at, at, at the time where it was a bit of a craze. And I remember I looked up on one of our stockists, because like, they hadn't stocked it yet, and they already sold out. And it was on for about 10 minutes because everyone was buying with their eyes. But yeah, that was one where we looked at them and we were like, as you can see, it's like, that we could sell that back to the bodega. I can't see it. That's, 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 yeah. that's Coca Cola. Oh yeah, my God. Coca-Cola. That is so dark. No, that, that, yeah, that? it's really sweet. But the Manimal is still present, I would say. Oh, nice. God, I, mean, I mean, some people. Wait. Hey, which one is that? That was a Manimal PX finish. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so we've done a few of those and we did an Oro Rosso right. as well. And then we did Ben React. Uh, we did another Ben React PX. And they tend to stand up to. To show you quite well. I think Pierre, I think the Ben Riant was bottled at 64% or 62%. It was very high APB. Yeah. But yeah, so you get weird and wonderful. We got some really exciting cars coming out. We work as we're working with Madeira a lot. So we use different types of Madeira. Um, and they come out like a rosé cup. When Rupert first saw first saw the Madeira it was an issue. So. Do you ever use the Manzanilla cast? Manzanilla, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was Manzanilla. I, so we, we're doing Malaga cast, which is basically sherry, but it's not because it's not made in Jerez. And then yeah. I'm Manzanilla, I'm not quite sure about the ruling. We're, we're trying to get hands on brandy. So brandy was another one he used a lot of. But he had a he had a, an amazing um, collection of Camembert in Masala in Madeira, um, to the point that Leon worked out that he bought 20 casts of Camembert on Christmas Day in Masala. So. 
I think at that time, someone told me that at the time they didn't really celebrate Christmas like we did. I was like, yeah, but still, have a day off, son. <laughs> um, so we've done two grain finishes as well uh, with another shop, um, Lubin's up in Bike, and they've, they've been brilliant. Madeira, Madeira's one that I'm really looking forward to working with more and more, so we're putting more and more on Madeira, just to sort of show you. Yeah, I picked up a 13-year-old Ben Rinis. That yeah. was a Boal. Boal, yeah, Boal Madeira. And that was the same, so it was like a rosé sort of colour to it. Yeah, lovely. Really nice. Yeah, so it's great to sort of try these different finishes. I suppose that's the fun thing as well. You're not being like, obviously you've got the history of the company, but you still be able to play about with all these different cast finishes because you're not trying to, you've not got a distillery, so you don't have to focus on bringing a distillery yeah, character yeah. through. You can sort of play it, have a bit more experimentation. A bit yeah, more freedom. absolutely. And I think, I mean... Obviously, for the big guys, you know, then if they want to experiment, uh, they've got to use a lot more stock than we do. So we were at this tasting, and we so we did the the Camberg and Salad for Luvians uh, at the Fife. And we're at supper, and so we did ours like small batch, only two hundred fifty bottles. And then Diageo and our trust, and the guys like this is our small batch. There's only fourteen thousand bottles. <laughs> I was like, I don't think we've even produced fourteen thousand bottles. Um, <laughs> So, so they can't even so they if they want to do a cast finish then they you've got to take a real big plunge of stock to do that so we could be a bit more nimble uh, and luckily at the moment we haven't really come across one where we're like we can't bottle that so it's all it's all sort of wasted so yeah we can experiment more and it's not too much detriment of something goes wrong it's you know it hurts a bit uh, but as you build more stock you can play around and now I think when we started we were very much doing first fills because it was almost yeah, we, we need to get it out a bit quicker to get the cash back. But now, you know, this has been for 37 and we're laying it down. We're just waiting for an SWA knock on our doors. Like, can't say it's finished. It's been there for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> if it's 20 years old and half its time has been in sharing. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's very exciting. And it just seemed, yeah, it's quite weird. I've, I've, I've been changing for four years and, you know, Leon's like pops on. I was like, oh, we put this in on, you, you know, in April 2018, I just started that. I hadn't even passed my probation yet. And you're, so you're seeing the sort of that time and that wonderful history of maturation coming through now, which is great. Excellent. Are you ready to finish with a lovely? I Yeah, I think I'm eyeing up my Kalila. It's sat there. Peter. Yes, Steve. I'm going to switch off and try and rejoin. All right, I will look for you. You're all blank. All right. All right. Right. You're just hearing voices. Hopefully I'll come back. All right, Steve. We'll see you shortly. Yeah. I smelt the fire in this the minute I opened the, the little bottle to decant it. John, what do you think of the inch gown? Before we move on, sorry, Molly, I, I agree. This this is a very refined <laughs> Kelly Lina, but... Yeah. The inch gown, yeah, it's, it's good. Uh, I found it quite spicy in the finish. Um, and, yeah, it's okay. I... I think, yeah, I think refill sherry is, it tends to be a bit more subtle, like you say, and uh, it does tend to work work better. Um, but like I said earlier on, I'm on, I think I'm on a bit more of a, a bourbon thing at the moment as well. So I'm, that's my sort of, I'm leaning towards towards that sort of thing a bit more at the moment. Um, but I do, you know, I do like a, the sherry matured whiskey as well. And again, the, what I think what's really stood out all the way through so far has just been the quality of what we've been been trying and you know that's that's really where it just that's what's good about it um yeah yeah again, again, keep man. that quality high and then yeah. you know and, and maintain that reputation because i suppose as an independent body you're only as good as your last out turn and yeah. you know it only takes one you know or, or two sort of substandard bottlings and suddenly your reputation's you know tarnished whereas if you keep putting out the quality stuff and that was the thing that I think was evident again at the at the festival when you came to Southport and the previous stations that you've done everything that we've tried, like you said before, whether it's something that suits your palate or not, the quality is, is evident and I think that's to be applauded. No, thank you very much. Yeah. Very kind. Yeah, it's it's you might not like the flavour, um, but hopefully there's no off notes. There's no something no great flaw into it. And and you're completely right. I think we always go as as a as the three of us we all go through this sort of the same stages so when you're trying it and you're selecting it's all very exciting like, i think that's great and you get into goes to the bottling and 
it first releases and it's just like dread. So like the first tasting you do for like the new release, you're like, oh, here we go. Like, let's say we all think it's great. We've all tried it. We all double checked and you roll it out to to sort of the, the whiskey drinkers. Um, and that's the reaction. But the one thing that we want is no one says, oh, you know, this just burns and this is just young and bad. And we also don't want people to say this is overpriced because the pricing does come into it. I know a lot of people don't, but we don't want to suddenly bottle something. I think price still reflects its quality. So, for instance, if I said the Blair Athlete 10 year old was 70 quid, you'd be like, well, it's all right. What's one of your sets? 40 quid. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, that's fair. So, I think you've got to match the price to that quality. And rather than obviously, we're still a business, we've got to look at the profit margins, um, which Rupert's teaching me. Because I was like, what would you pay for it for? He goes, well, what did we buy it for? <laughs> <laughs> um but it's that mentality of like what would you pay for this rather than you know not everything's you know scientific so we do take a a, a cut so to speak if it's not i think everybody appreciates the fact that you know everybody's in business and businesses have to make money otherwise there's no business no. i think what people object to is some of the sort of quite blatant profiteering that's that's you know, been been happening. There's a lot of some of the you know, some of these online shops and things, and you know, some of the whiskey stuff. And the, the prices are incredible. And it's you know, it's just how do you justify you know charging that much for that bottle of that ten year old whiskey? You know, it's just okay. it doesn't just doesn't compute. And I know everything's going up and everything's getting more expensive, and mm. fuels going up, and you know, Blast. The, the, all, all the you know mm. all all the utilities are going up, and everything's getting more expensive. Um, but th there's got to come a point where people have got to go hang on a minute I'm not prepared to put my hand in my pocket and pay that amount for that Irri you know, irrespective of how good you're going to tell me it is mm. it, it just doesn't warrant that that investment no exactly and you know there, obviously there are that's another side of it as well the whole sort of investment side of things and people looking to sort of make some fast money out of buying some casks and, and you know doing all that sort of stuff mm. but at the end of the day as a whiskey drinker, what you want is you want quality at an affordable price. And, and that's that's what it's about, really. And that's where, again, some of these other, I suppose, lesser known distilleries like your Glen Dullins, things like that. That's where I think they, you know, they've got a real chance because they're not that high profile. They're not a McCallum, you know, they're, they're not a Bernard Berg. They're, 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 they can you're going to be able to put them out at reasonable prices and people can actually afford to buy them and drink them and you know that's what we want to do mm. we don't want to be buying it to put on a shelf or in the back of a cupboard and never see it again exactly or, you know send it off to auction in the hope you're going to make a few quid on it you know that's not what it's about mm. i mean i think it's also a learning curve you talked about cask investment um where i mean we've been offered casks at a ridiculous price yeah. And we sort of break it down. So we're going to buy sort of 12 year old, whatever it was, and we would have to retail it at 150 quid. And so when everyone gets promised these wonderful returns on physical cast assets, I mean, Rupert's other side of the business is, is a bit more um, in depth to cast investment because it's a trading platform. So he's not sending you casks, sending leases of alcohol. Um, but so like when someone gets promised these casks, and I, I've had it on my brother's boss. Was like, oh, I've just been offered like an eight-year-old whiskey for 50K. And you go, well, the thing is, everyone thinks it's a great investment, but if it doesn't come back into the industry, then you're basically in a Ponzi scheme. And so if it's not going into whiskey, so if you buy an eight-year-old whiskey for 50K, I'm, I'm sure that it wasn't 50K, but around that. And then they're getting promised 20, 30%. Uh, can you see how Steve, you're back? Yeah. Um, they're getting promised 30% returns in a year, so then they're going to go and sell it for you know 65k to the next guy and go, Great, I'm going to sell it for 80k for the next guy. And, and then suddenly it comes back to the industry, and that some person's just been absolutely screwed because the industry's just got one I'm not going to buy. Yeah, I'm not going to buy that because it's yeah, because what are we going to put into the boss line as it is a business yeah. at the end of the day? So, yeah. do be very careful when you get sold the dream on the yeah. investment and bottle. I mean, my uncle phoned me up, so my cousin was telling me 18, so I want to buy him like. Uh, uh, what's going to be worth quite a lot in the future? I was like, I have no idea. You know, it doesn't really work like that. Yeah. Do you, you suddenly get BBC saying a man bought like a case a year of McCann in the eighties, and now he's just made a million out of it? So that's just that's pretty fine. Drink whiskey. 
bottle it, drink yeah. it, enjoy it. That's but nobody's doing. drinking those Macallum really expensive bottles. They're just going into some mm. center somewhere being stored and then they're going to be traded somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, but, we, we went around and I, well, I had a distillery tour there. And this is amazing piece of architecture. I can't fault it. And, you know, there's a wonderful entry into whiskey. If you don't know what whiskey is, it's a great way to start. But the first part of the tour was all about connecting. Oh, God. No. But we want no. this to be like a piece of art. <laughs> And we are just there, like, oh, oh I'm so, so close. I'm so close to coming back, but the first five minutes, like, oh, yeah, so this was in the 70s. And, and so all these labels are different than painted by this painter. And we want it to be like an art collection. And you're like, no, 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 no. Oh, that makes me so sad. And, yeah. the and, like, and, then, and then the rest of the tour was amazing. That was only at the start. The rest of the tour was about <laughs> the production, the capacity, and the cast, and the maturation, and what they do, and you know, the history. And you're like, this is brilliant. Just don't take me to the wall of fortune, basically, at the start. <laughs> and tell me yeah, how much each, each thing is. Um, so we're on to Kalila. On to Kalila, yes. yes. Wonderful distillery. I think it produces 12.5 million litres a year. But and they do the reason amazing. it's amazing. It's just a brilliant distillery. And, you know, it, it sort of stands up to every sort of ill informed. Whiskey is like smaller craft distilleries, hand cut makes the best whiskey. Old Port Ellen is the best whiskey. The reason why Port Ellen shut down is because Curly was around. So <laughs> it's, I, I must, it's one of my opinions like Port Ellen shut for a reason. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. But it about quality, was it? Yeah. It just, um, and then you've got this wonderful, wonderful Curly that makes all types of. Of even and the consistency of the spirit as well is yeah. ridiculous to produce that amount of whiskey and the consistency be spot on every single time. And I think a lot of people say, like, oh, I've never had a bad independent Boston Coley. No, I think that's quite true. But if you go to the distillery, they do this amazing chocolate whiskey pairing mm. tasting that you can do. It's like a special one. And it's a local Isla chocolate maker, I think. Um, if it's not, it's, it's a Scottish chocolate maker. And they just blend it so well. And, you know, it might be a, a, um, a Diageo distillery, which I, I, fi I find going to Diageo distilleries interesting, but it's like the same tour all, all over again and the health and safety. And it's very um, sterile, right? But Kalila just continuously does a great whiskey. And I think they just get on with it and they just continue to deliver. So if you're getting a, a Kalila cask, it's hard to go wrong. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I'm, long may we can get a handle on Kalila. I don't know how long we can do it because, again, I think the sort of role a lot of people say, when I explain what independent bottling is to people who might not know whiskey or part of a club, and you sort of say, oh, we buy the cask and we, it's underwriting the label, but we say the distillery, and people go, why, why are you allowed to do that? It's because these bigger companies are seeing the reaction to a distillery, and I think the reaction towards Kolila, uh, it's just been amazing. Obviously, Kolila could produce enough whiskey, but they could just turn it into they do the twelve and the eighteen, but they could turn it into something that's just absolutely fantastic. I mean, this is this was the one that sold out the quickest as well. This this followed by the uh, the Blair Athol, but this one just flew out. Did it? Yeah. I didn't get this one, but it is really nice. Yeah, it's lovely and. So we did an 11-year-old small batch. So 11-year-old small batch was just refill and maybe a recharge hogshead. Um, as so we decided to bottle this at the same time, because the 11-year-old's older, but it's just, it's like raw. It's like raw curly lips. Absolutely brilliant. It's like proper ashy bonfire. What we found with this, this is just spent 10 years in a recharge hogshead. And it's quite, it's well refined curly lip. So you have the raw 11-year-old, and I'll say this is more refined. And it's got that lovely, again, that lovely smoke, but it's almost like in a coat of sort of sweetness and vanilla. And it's just a lovely sort of smouldering vine. It's, it's lovely. And again, bottled at, I think, yeah, 56%. So car strength, just a really nice danger. I shouldn't really say I'll get in trouble with uh, advertising balls, but coughable coalina. That's just warms, warms you up. Probably wrong time to have it when it's 20 odd degrees outside, but just a really well refined does it again i don't think it needs a lot of water obviously play around with it um but comparing it to the 11 year old which you think 
you know, the, the rule of thumb when it comes to piece of whiskey, the older it is, that there's less peat involved. Also, this is younger, but comparing it to the 11 year old, the 11 year old is a sort of untamed stallion, whilst this is just a lovely sort of pony club. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well trained. Uh, <laughs> old. But yeah, just nice. smouldering ash, a saline. The lingual yep. absolutely just that recharge just brings in something uh, again our single cast tends to be first for the recharge because it just like we love working with recharge because it's just very unique and uh, it's awesome again we don't know if it was um a sherry or a um or a bourbon um cast before we just get told it's uh recharge or new wood as they say on the spreadsheets but um oh, it's great it's a great example of again how diverse coli it can be and it's still good. I think, you know, you can go to Code and ask how much peak you want and all this sort of stuff. Um, it's just an amazing fracture. And if you're you guys looking at, um, sorry, if you go. Yeah, if you own Code Lily, you basically own Johnny Walker. So no. I think Tiaz, you're going to sell it anytime soon. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant distillery. Are you guys looking at, um, or have you already done sourcing spirit and put it into your own casks? No, we haven't. Again, we can't quite sit or uh, tie up cash for that long. Mm. Um, something that we would love to do. Um, and then you can start putting it into, you know, you, you could do like a 10 year refilm sauna thing. But mm. um, no, and again, that's probably quite old school with that's on a handshake with the, the old Scotch family. Yeah. You know, it would be so cool. I guess the thing that we have to do is uh, buy a distillery and own one and then you could do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a long way off, sadly. Yeah. So obviously you're looking at getting your own bonded warehouse eventually so you can have all your casks in one place or yeah we, we were talking about this the other day and i actually think you know, obviously being the set being the salesman it's i could be a bit more um sort of i get more excited about like the, the more attractive things of the industry so like i love our own cooperage i love this but then you have to admit if you were going to do something you'll buy your own bossing hall first Right. Okay. So it just makes life so much easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's just perhaps I'm too busy to like catch your bottom line and all that sort of stuff. And it makes more <laughs> sense. And you control them and it'd be your warehouse. And eventually you end up at a distillery, I guess. Or you just want to go straight to the distillery. Oh, we'll find out. We'll make it. We'll, we'll find out what we can do with that. Don't worry about that. But, no, but bottling hole would be the first idea then. You get your own bottling hole first. That'd be yeah. It. Because again, if you get your own warehouse, you store all your stock in that warehouse and that warehouse burns down and yeah, so yeah. In fact, it's probably safer, safer yeah. than having it spread out all over Scotland. So yeah, you sort of a... yeah, because you don't. I mean, what well, there was a case in America in Kentucky. Was it um, Maker's Mark? Lost one warehouse, and Rupert who used to work for for Beam. It was like that's not even a scratch on their sort of supply there. Their warehouses are massive as well, aren't they? They're Absolutely. really high. I think all the fish died sadly in the in the river because mm. there was that much whiskey that went in there. Actually, it doesn't surprise me that it wasn't a, a mark because they're huge. No, absolutely. And yes, in the US, you can have these massive warehouses. Yeah, absolutely. You don't get that here. If you, there's just not enough space. No, it's quite well hidden. I mean, I was up in space the other day in Glen Fiddick's warehouse. So you wouldn't even, obviously, you could see the sort of those gaps in the trees, but you don't really, everyone sort of hides it. Mm. Um, but yeah, it would probably be a Boston. But Rupert used to run the bottom hall at McLeod's. He's like, oh, do you want to do it? I said, nah, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go around doing the health and safety and all that sort of stuff. So. <laughs> but yeah, so um, what do you think of Lila? That might sort, sort of John Wright out. Oh, I loved it. It's really yeah. So it's, it, but it, you know, it, it is like you know, the bonfire the day after versus on the day. As yeah, you said, exactly. it's refined. It's, it's got yeah. that it does have that lovely smooth as opposed to that raw in your face and on fire. So I, I yeah, it is classic, perfect Kalina. Yeah, it's lovely. I think you summed it up perfectly there, Margaret. It's, there's a bonfire, but not not on the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's lovely. Uh, I'm a big Kalina fan, so it, it, it was an easy decision really for me to pick this one up as, as my bottle. Um, yeah, I think it's great. Uh, it's like I say, just yeah, it is a, it's a little bit more more refined, 
Um, I've had quite a lot of independent Kalima and, you know, like you say, it's hard to sort of find, you know, a substandard one, really. I'm, I'm sure they do exist, but um, <laughs> generally you look speaking, hard enough. If you don't try yeah, it, one. Generally speaking, I think it, you know, they're very, very good. Again, we, well, the, the Kalima, the, the wee bottle, that was a sherry one, wasn't it, for the festival? Yep. And that's, you know, very highly regarded as well. I think it's one of those sort of spirits that again stands up to pretty much anything you want to throw at it. So you put it in any kind of cask and it it'll do something and generally t- turns out pretty good in the end. And it's quite a versatile spirit. It um, is, definitely. Yeah. But I, I like it again in its sort of more natural form and it's you know sort of expert and uh, and then you know it recharges good. Mm. Yeah, I think it's lovely. Yeah. Let's bring her back full circle, but it's also in the chain more cats. So they are yeah. Yeah, it's there it, there's definitely uh, a, a connection there. Yeah, yeah, it's good. That's brilliant to do. Again, it's been around, I think, since like eight, 1817 or something like that, or 1815. It's been around for absolutely years. Yeah. I'm going to Isla for a family holiday. So I'm, I'm, everyone I'm wants to go and see our well. bag. It's like, no, going to see Canada. <laughs> I like I'm hoping, I'm, to get, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get to uh, to Isla in September. Um, and they're supposed to be opening up tours at Kalina again in August. So hopefully, I'm gonna I've got to break in. Yeah, hopefully we <laughs> might, might we might get a get a look around Kalina. We've yeah. kind of planned the tours already, but um, you know, hopefully if it's open, we'll we'll get in there as well. But uh, we're only there for a couple of days. Yeah. We were there in I think it was late September. It might have been October, and we definitely did. I mean, all the distilleries were open, but that was obviously pre-COVID. So, yeah. um, I shouldn't say obviously it was pre-COVID, mm. um, and everything was open, and you could go pretty much any time, anywhere. But if you do go, do the Kalila and you do the tour, I suggest you do the chocolate tasting because chocolate it pan. really is an amazing experience. They take you down into the sort of it's in a, a slightly separate part of the distillery, but it, it was definitely worthwhile. And my poor mum, she was sick. She had to go back. She's not a huge whiskey fan, so I'm wondering if she's decided that she wasn't feeling well, so she didn't have to do it. But we saved the chocolate for her. I was going to say, you must have had the drams, though, Margo, surely. You had her drams on her behalf. Oh, we didn't, no, we didn't. We, they, they refunded her, but they said, well, we've already ordered the chocolate, so take that back to her. So they were actually really quite generous. Oh, that's quite generous. That's very nice. Um, and so, yeah, so it was me and my dad. And because um, he's a, I, he and I are both like massive Pete whiskey fans, and the, and the whole reason for us going was, is he and I want to taste whiskey, and it's like, but mom, you're not going to drive, so what's the point? Who's <laughs> your <laughs> <laughs> driver? <laughs> oh. I remember because I, I stole yeah, dad's like being sixteen. I always thought whiskey was tasted like spate. I always thought it was peaty, and I absolutely loved it the moment I tried it. Um, until I worked in that shop and I, I tried a Glen Farkless 10 I was like it doesn't taste yeah. like whiskey what have you been drinking <laughs> all of this stuff over here it's brilliant I absolutely love it yeah my mum yeah. because we all drink whiskey when we're going we're, all, all the family are coming um, mum had to be the, the designated driver when we went to Royal Lot Lagarde so I think dad might be stuck with a short straw this one. yeah but your mum grew up driving in the UK mm. my mum US not so much. No, not so much. Especially not Nyla. <laughs> not a lot of room for cars. No, so we 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 did do a driver. We we did we went up to um to Dufton as well and, and Oban and, and all that. But you know, it's funny because I'm introducing a few of my friends into whiskey and I start with the Darwinny because it's such a lightweight, you know, introductory, and then I move up to McCallum and I slowly get them into yeah. the the peaks. Uh, but it takes it does take about a year to get people yeah. into the yeah. whiskey unless they really take to whiskey and then I'm like, try this. Mm. Got to warm yeah. them up. And but little trick next time you're driving an island, and we did yeah. um, uh, us. So a friend of mine lives. She lives out there, and she had all of us in the back of her uh, basically uh, Land Cruiser, and she was driving. Yeah. She kept something like this, and everyone was like waving back. Like, what are you doing? Goes, well, if they're local, they wave back. So you just, and it's not like an obvious wave, it's just off the steering wheel, you just go like that. And we're like, that's a bit weird. And we realized that everyone was doing it. So it's great. And so by the end of the journey, 
when it's sort of all like leaning out the car and someone do a thing, and if someone didn't do a thing, you go, you're tourist! <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just, if you want to be one of the locals, just they all wave at each other. Just the one finger wave. One finger wave. No, it's not a big right. one, it's just a... Um, I think though, when I go back to Isla, my, my old boss has a, he owns two cottages on Isla, so he's agreed to rent them to me at, at discount price, lovely man. Um, and we're just going to rent bikes. Yeah, <laughs> just cover the drivers, I guess. Oh, you're going to end up in a ditch after a couple yeah. of distilleries, Margot. That's going to be... <laughs> Sorry? You're going to end up in a ditch after a couple of distilleries. It's going to be well, a... all yeah, over the road. We met, we met a couple who said, who were biking, and they said, oh, no, no, it's it's all fine because we just, you know, then have some food and whatever. So, so that, anyway, but you're right. I mean, it, it could be quite deadly, but is there any... Is there a better way to go than drinking whiskey? Yes. True. I think there's many taxis on either as well. So I think all of that. There are actually quite a few. There's so. quite a few. There we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but um, I, I, I seriously, the, there's just something really special about Isla, and you know it's not just the whiskey. There's just something amazing about Island, and I look forward to going to Mall because I think you you might get that same feeling there, but I don't know yet. So, yeah, it's, it's, so I wish you a brilliant family holiday. Yeah, the, the West, yeah, there's, my mum's called Irish, so she's from Aberdeen, but she's never been to her namesake. So Ooh. this year she was like, I'm getting, going back to the namesake. But yeah, she's she's from Aberdeen, so East Coast. So we, we did Fort William last year, um, and we've always gone up to Scotland, but we've always gone up to sort of Aberdeen way or rural D side. So it's nice to get, I love the West Coast. It's absolutely brilliant. And you say it's very magical. Yeah. I'll do it tomorrow. I think it's that mantra. <laughs> it's quite similar to mine. Right, we will sum up with a favourite drama of the night and then I'll stop the recording. Obviously, you can still hang around if you want to, guys. Um, Steve, what was your favourite drama of the night? Um, well, I've got a problem because I like the last three. Um, you, can, you can say the last three your favourite. I mean, that's... Well, I'm picking between the Vendolin and the Inchgower. I think the inch camera might just edge it. Might just. Good choices. Well, I'm yes. going to be very. That, the, the, <laughs> I like the, everyone's choices. So. Yeah, the Quiler is uh, superb as well. Mm. It's very difficult. Yeah. Ben, what was your favourite? I think he's frozen. Oh, no. He has frozen. Or he's just sitting very uh, still. John, you there? John, you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Sorry, um, He's dreaming about Isla, I think. Yeah, um, I think the Kalila is is exceptional. Uh, the Glen Dullan as well. Those those are my top two, uh, and then the Blair Athol, I think. And then I mean the trademark X can probably fit in anywhere because it's just it is it's really good. Um, the Craig Ellicky probably comes bottom of my list just because I I struggle with the nose on it, but um, but like I say, you know, the, like I said before. The, the quality across the range is evident. So, you know, hats off. I think it's it's great. Really good. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Mm. Margot, what was your favourite? Well, I, I agree with John. My two tops were the Kalila and the, the Gondola. Uh, Gondola and, then, and then probably the Blair Apple. And again, I'm still happy. I'm very happy I bought it. Um, they were all really good. And I don't think you could go wrong with whatever bottle you purchase. Mm. Excellent. And my favourite is definitely the Craig Elegy because it's fun and weird. Oh, yeah. <laughs> personality quite well. Yeah. Oh, quite, I very much like the Craig Elegy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've stopped the recording. Mine, Peter, Pete, you, Peter, you've stopped the recording, right? 